All right, so glucose metabolism, aka eating and breaking all organic molecules down. Um, I, I hate snakes, by the way, but uh, but that's just so cool as far as uh, being able to eat something larger than itself. So in this lecture, we're going to look at the other organelle that is so important for most organisms, and that is the mitochondria. Um, now, one thing I want to make abundantly clear, because you, people usually think that plants just have chloroplasts, and then all other organisms have mitochondria. Even plants have mitochondria. If you think about it, only the leaves of the plants are actually undergoing photosynthesis and making glucose. But then the plant then still has to turn around and turn that glucose into ATP when it's undergoing metabolism. Now the plant's metabolism is much slower than yours and I's, so therefore it doesn't need to produce uh, as much ATP in the moment like you and I, but they still have mitochondria. This is a, something that people always just overlook and say, oh no, plants have chloroplasts, that's what makes their energy. No, they make the glucose and then in those same cells can turn around and break the glucose down when they need it. Remember, the plant's not always being exposed to uh, um, sunlight, so it only makes sugars during that period of time that the sun is, is up and then it stores those sugars as starches and as sucrose and things like that and then it'll break it down as it grows and as it needs it. Now you and I on the other hand, we cannot make the glucose. We cannot undergo photosynthesis. So the only way to be able to get energy for our cells needs is to eat something else that has that energy already made. Now you can eat the plant that is making the glucose. You can eat an animal that ate the plant. You can eat an animal that ate the animal that ate the plant. I'd rather do the latter. Um, that ultimately allows you to get your fuel molecules. Now when we say glucose metabolism, we don't just mean sugars. We actually mean all metabolism. But you'll see in uh, today's uh, lecture that it starts with glucose and then as you go through the process of metabolism, all organic molecules are incorporated in one spot or another. In fact, let me jump ahead and just... Right here. It starts with glucose. But then the amino acids can come in at different stages of the game. And fatty acids can come in at different stages of the game. So we're really looking at all organic molecules. Now we really don't use nucleic acids as a fuel source because source, their primary role is for information storage. Um, but we can metabolize proteins, carbohydrates, and fats all through this same pathway. So that's why we call it glucose metabolism is because it starts with glucose, but then everything else can come in at any point um, through it. Now, not every living organism needs mitochondria to undergo glucose metabolism, but it is inefficient if you don't have mitochondria. Okay, so all living organisms, all cells, have the ability to break down sugars into ATP. But the difference is, in the presence of mitochondria, you can get somewhere upwards of 36 to 40 ATP per glucose. In the absence of mitochondria, you get two. Okay, so big difference from the same glucose molecule. That's really the difference between having mitochondria and not having mitochondria. Okay, ATP, as we know, is that battery that fuels protein synthesis and muscle contractions and, and all other metabolic processes. If you remember from the cell um, video where that uh, vesicle is being walking along the microtubules, every step takes ATP. So even in the simplest of cells, every little process that's going on requires at least some energy uh, in order for that to be able to occur. Now, some cells are just fine making 2 ATP. You'll find that bacteria and very simple cells, 
they're fine doing this. They don't have mitochondria, so therefore they just break down glucose, get two ATP out of it, dump the rest of the energy out, out, outward and, and don't even bother using it. You and I, on the other hand, use so much ATP that without mitochondria, we can't function. Our cells would not be able to produce the amount of energy required for our metabolic needs. So there are three ways, actually, in which ATP can be made. We have aerobic respiration, anaerobic respiration, and fermentation. And they go in that order as far as efficiency. So what is the most efficient way of producing ATP? It's not only with mitochondria, but with oxygen as a substrate. And that's why we call it aerobic respiration. So organisms that use mitochondria and oxygen, they produce the mass quantities of ATP. Now, just below that, the same mechanics apply to some other organisms that have mitochondria, but they don't use oxygen. They use something else like nitrogen, or they can even use carbon dioxide during this process. Carbon dioxide, uh, nitrogen gas, uh, and the like. That's what we call anaerobic respiration. So there is a difference between that, uh, uh, what substrate they use to break glucose down into ATP. Oxygen is by far the most efficient way, uh, and that's what you and I do. That's why when we breathe in, we breathe in oxygen. Now other organisms like bacteria in the soil uh, that do have the capability of undergoing this process with mitochondria can uh, undergo um, a higher rate of metabolism, produce ATP by using nitrogen instead of oxygen, and that's what we call anaerobic respiration. So when we go through this process, we're not really going to distinguish between aerobic and anaerobic because they are virtually the same. The only difference is what's used at the end. Is it oxygen? Is it nitrogen? Is it carbon dioxide? Is it something other than oxygen? You know, that's really the main difference between the two. On the other hand, fermentation is the process that is coupled when there is no mitochondria. Or under extreme circumstances where our body is not producing enough ATP through aerobic respiration alone, that's when our cells will kick in with fermentation. That will be the last concept we talk about. We won't get to that today. But, um, so our cells do undergo fermentation, but only under very stressful conditions. You know, like when you're exercising. Um, so, I'm not kidding. So, as long as you have enough oxygen, your body doesn't need to undergo fermentation. But when you start using more energy than you can produce through aerobic respiration alone, that's when fermentation kicks in. That's when you start getting the muscle cramps and things like that. So we'll talk about lactic acid buildup and other things. Now, what is the process? What's the overall process? Well, guess what? It is the exact opposite of photosynthesis. And I mean exact. We take in glucose. We take in oxygen. Those now are the substrates. Those are the reactants. That's what we metabolize. And the products are carbon dioxide, water. We make water during this process. But instead of being luminescent beings and giving off light, as we know how photosynthesis works, we make ATP, which is the same concept. It's energy that's being produced through the breaking down of these covalent bonds. So they are literally reverses of one another. So you see right here, photosynthesis, you have carbon dioxide, water, and light going in, glucose and oxygen coming out, aerobic metabolism, glucose and oxygen going in, carbon dioxide, water, and ATP coming out. But one of the fascinating things, and I will test you on this concept, is when you look at the energy that is contained within our cells, where does it have its origins? What's the origin of all the energy in your body? We are literally sun-driven. We just not directly, but indirectly, the energy that is in our cells originated from our sun. So we're not Superman in the sense that we absorb it and get superpowers and whatnot, but every ounce of energy that is holding your cells together those covalent bonds that hold your organic molecules together, they have their origins in the sunlight. 
So we are really children of the stars, our atoms and our energy. All right, one of the things I want to illustrate here is you've already familiar with photosynthesis. You have the light reactions where water goes in, water gets split, and oxygen comes out. You make ATP and NADPH. Calvin cycle takes in carbon dioxide, turns it into glucose. Well, going from right to left, this is the overview of glucose metabolism. Notice it's the exact opposite. Glucose gets broken down. As it's being broken down, carbon dioxide is released. That's why we have to breathe out carbon dioxide, is those are the byproducts of metabolism. So as we breathe out carbon dioxide, plants just take it back up, and hence the circle of life. As we undergo the last and final process, this is where oxygen is required, where we breathe in oxygen, and it gets turned back into water. And then so, really, we're just recycling these atoms and exchanging energy between one and another. All right. So this is just a, a simple diagram of the three methods of um, metabolism that I just talked about. Notice, aerobic and anaerobic respiration are exactly the same. The only difference is aerobic uses oxygen, anaerobic uses something other than oxygen. But the mechanics are exactly the same. So we call this cellular respiration. Okay? That includes both aerobic and anaerobic. anaerobic. Uh, you'll see me mention that sometimes as cellular respiration, which is the same process no matter what the end substrate is that uh, uh, is used in that process. Now, notice over here, it's missing pretty much everything. So this process of fermentation does not occur in the mitochondria. In fact, it either only occurs when there's no mitochondria or when the mitochondria are at max capacity like when you're exercising, okay? So fermentation is by far one of the most wasteful uh, processes that only extracts a tiny bit of energy out of glucose. And that will be for the end of the lecture next time. All right, so let's look at a mitochondria's overall structure and shape. Unlike the chloroplasts, um, notice this actually shows a plant cell which is good because it shows here's the chlorophyll or the chloroplast which is undergoes photosynthesis and then right next to it is a mitochondria because the plant will make the glucose and then it needs to break it down as it needs the ATP. Well it has a double membrane, it has an outer membrane and then it has this huge inner membrane that's folded back in on itself. What do you think these, this folding over and over and over and over does for the organelle? What does that increase? surface area. And by increasing the surface area, this tiny organelle can actually produce a lot more energy than if it just had another big double membrane here and a huge open space in the middle. By having those folds, because that's where the ATP is really made mostly, uh, is in those inner folds, which we call the cristae, uh, that's why that increased surface area increases its uh, ATP production. Now, this is probably one of the most valuable pictures you have for this lecture. It illustrates over half of the concepts or questions that I'm going to give you on your quiz. So make note of that, that this is one that you absolutely should have in front of you as you're doing the quiz because it answers so many different questions. Now this gives an overview as far as what are the four steps of glucose metabolism that we're going to cover. The first one is called glycolysis. What you need to know about glycolysis, for now, we're going to go into more details there in a little bit, is every cell can do this. Every cell. Whether it's a bacteria, fungus, plant, animal, doesn't matter. All organisms can undergo glycolysis. Notice it's in the cytoplasm. It's not in the mitochondria. So it doesn't matter whether you have mitochondria or not, all organisms can undergo glycolysis. And that will definitely be something I test you on. Okay? So it doesn't matter what your species is. Glycolysis is universal. Notice glycolysis makes some ATP, two ATP in fact. And for some organisms, that's it. That's all they, they do to make energy is undergo glycolysis 
and then they waste the rest of the energy that's still there in the products of glycolysis and they just go off by the wayside. Well, in more advanced cells where they have mitochondria, we can still extract tons of energy from the products of glycolysis. And that's where we get into the last three steps. So these last three steps require mitochondria to occur. What are they? The preparatory reactions, the citric acid cycle, aka Krebs cycle, named after the scientist who discovered it. Okay, so the citric acid cycle essentially tells you what the cycle does and makes citric acid and, and whatnot, but we call it the Krebs cycle after the scientist. And then the last but definitely not least the electron transport chain. This is where the bulk of ATP is produced. We're going to show how that's done. Okay. So those, those three reactions, the preparatory reactions, citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain happen in the mitochondria. So you have to have mitochondria for that to be able to occur. That's why these belong to aerobic and anaerobic respiration, whereas glycolysis is universal. Glycolysis is in any, any cell, any organism, any time. All right. So let's start with glycolysis. Glyco, having to do with glucose, lysis means to break apart. So all glycolysis is, is the initial stages of breaking glucose down and extracting energy by breaking its covalent bonds. Now I want to point out, this is a lot of organic chemistry, none of which you're going to have to know. But I want to point out something. In the initial stages of glycolysis, the cell actually has to add or put energy into it before it can get energy out. Do you remember what we call this energy that is needed to get the ball rolling? The activation energy. Good. The energy of activation. So that gets the ball rolling and then the cell can get four ATP out of each glucose. But since it invested two, the net gain is two. So it puts two in, gets four out, so the net gain is two ATP. So that's why glycolysis only makes two ATP. Now, there's another molecule that's made here that will be important for later on called NADH. It seems very familiar. It's just missing the P. It's not NADPH, but guess what? It's pretty much exactly the same as NADPH. What is NADPH again that we just learned in photosynthesis? What is it? What do we call it? It's going to be important for this lecture. We call it an electron what? Electron carrier. Okay, so make sure you remember that. In photosynthesis, the electron carriers that they use are called NADPH. In glucose metabolism, the electron carriers that we use, there's actually two, but one of the first ones is called NADH. So make sure you know that terminology. It will show up on a lot of these quiz questions here. So NADH. So let's go back to here. That's really the sum of the whole. When glycolysis occurs, glucose is broken down into pyruvate. Now what is pyruvate? It's essentially glucose split in half. There, there are these three carbon molecules that you break a bond of glucose and you get pyruvate is what we call it. They're just these three carbon uh, structures. Um, in the breaking of that covalent bond, ATP is made. As well as, remember when you break a covalent bond, you release electrons. That's what these are. They're electron carriers. They literally grab the electrons that used to be there when the... Uh, atoms were sharing them and pulls them away from it and stores them. That's why they're called electron carriers. I also want to point out, just for the sake of it, what we got here. PGAL. Same stuff that was put together to make glucose. So when glucose is broken down, you can see that it's just the reverse process as it goes through there. Yeah, you're not going to be tested on that. But 
But you know, just to illustrate, this is just a reverse of what the Calvin cycle essentially does. All right. Now, enzymes are studied throughout this whole process, and you're not going to have to know a single one of them, okay? The names of them or anything like that, okay? I'm going to, I'll mention one of them, but it's not critical for any of your questions, okay? But every step of the way, there's enzymes. There's an enzyme that's breaking this bond, making ATP, doing this and that. So we ignore most of them for the sake of simplicity, but just be aware that every metabolic reaction, there's an enzyme involved in that process, okay? All right, now, if mitochondria is present in the cell, and if the cell has the capacity to bring those substrates in, which is pyruvate, um, then it will go through the last three steps. But as I mentioned, sometimes the mitochondria are working at max capacity, like in our cells, producing ATP. And if that's the case, there's no other way to make ATP be besides these three mechanisms except for more glycolysis. So we'll explain why fermentation kicks in in our cells when we're pushing them beyond their limits of uh, of uh, ATP production, so to speak. All right, so let's assume that everything's working fine. We're not using tons of ATP. Uh, we're just chilling on our couch or whatnot. We're able to take pyruvate into the mitochondria via what we call the preparatory reaction. So that's the second stage of this. Now, this is the only step that does not produce any ATP directly. Okay? Notice there is no ATP production here. Okay? Even though a covalent bond is broken, there is no ATP production. So what happens in the preparatory reactions is actually pretty simple. The three carbon pyruvates are brought into the mitochondria, and an enzyme breaks one of the covalent bonds and um, makes what we call these electron carriers, NADH. So remember, every time you break a covalent bond, it extracts those electrons that were holding the atoms together, and that makes these electron carriers. Well, this is the first stage, too, in which carbon dioxide is produced. So as one of the carbons of the pyruvate is being broken off, carbon dioxide starts building up. Well, as carbon dioxide builds up, it diffuses through simple diffusion out of the mitochondria, out of our cells, into our bloodstream, to our lungs, and into the air. So that's really, again, same process, simple diffusion. As carbon dioxide builds up, it gets picked up as it goes from high to low concentrations and it diffuses out through all the membranes of the cells and into our, our blood. All right, now what's left over? After the pyruvate is cut, you get this two carbon molecule, which we call an acetyl group, okay? So there's still tons of energy, even in those last two atoms sharing that covalent bond. There's still tons, okay, uh, that you can extract from that. Um, so that's the preparatory reactions. Pyruvate is cut, turns it into an acetyl and a carbon dioxide, and the electrons are picked up and you make uh, some electron carriers. That's it. That's the preparatory reactions. So when you come back to this picture right here, that's why this is what you're seeing right here. It doesn't label it, unfortunately, in this picture, but that's what you're seeing. You're making electron carriers, you're making carbon dioxide, and the pyruvate is being prepared to go into the Krebs cycle, aka citric acid cycle. Okay. All right. Now, why do we call this the citric acid cycle? Well, why do we call the Calvin cycle the C3 cycle? Because that first step of the cycle really is what gives it its name. The Calvin cycle, the C3 cycle, is because it makes those PGA molecules that are a three carbon molecule. Well, guess what? The first step of the citric acid cycle is to make citric acid. So here's, again, don't worry about any of the uh, organic chemistry going on here, but here's how it works. An enzyme called coenzyme A bi uh, binds this four carbon to the acetyl group making citric acid. Then it goes through this complex process of chopping these, car uh, uh, these carbon atoms off and extracting the electron energy and making a little ATP on the side as well. 
So here's where the remainder of the carbons that made up the glucose that you took into your cells are being released. By the end of the citric acid cycle, the atoms that made up the carbon have all been turned back into, or that, that made up the glucose, have all been turned back into carbon dioxide. And, and your body is getting rid of them because of that buildup. Now, the citric acid cycle not only makes these electron carriers, NADH, but another one that you'll need to know called FADH2. It's, it, it does the same thing. This is an electron carrier, FADH2, NADH, these are all electron carriers. And then it makes a little ATP, two. Well, one per acetyl, and, but it, it, for every glucose, it's two. So let's go back and sum it up. All right, now notice, if you have a six carbon glucose come in, the preparatory reactions releases a couple, and then by the time the Krebs cycle is over, all the remaining carbons that made up that glucose, they're now carbon dioxide. Here, the Krebs cycle, this is an important concept that I'll test you on. This is where the bulk of what we call electron carriers are made, NADH, and FADH2. In fact, this is the only spot where FADH2 is made. You notice that glycolysis, the preparatory reactions, and the Krebs cycle, they all make electron carriers. But this is where the bulk of the electron carriers are made. Now, the big question becomes, glucose is gone. All of the covalent bonds that held the atoms together, they're all broken, okay? But you've only made four ATP at this point. What the hell, you know? <laughs> where is all the energy? Well, that brings us to the last and final step, the electron transport chain. The energy is stored in these electron carriers. So get ready to have your mind blown by what happens next. This is where it culminates. Now, this is the reason why the mitochondria have a double membrane. The outer membrane and the inner membrane form this little pocket that is surrounds the, you know, the cristae, which is where the electron transport chain is at. Well, guess what? All of the electron carriers that are made in glycolysis, the preparatory reactions, and the citric acid cycle, they all dump their electrons into the electron transport chain. Now, guess what happens? As these electrons travel down these protein complexes, the energy that's in these electrons gets used to pump hydrogen ions into this inner membrane space. And as the hydrogen ions build up in their concentration, they're allowed out of this membrane back into the matrix of the mitochondria, down their concentration gradient, facilitated diffusion through an enzyme, ATP synthase, thus making ATP. What do we call this again? Stupid word, right? Chemiosmotic phosphorylation. The same process that plants use in photosystem two to make ATP. The only difference is we're getting our energized electrons from the sugars and the fats and the proteins that we eat. So that those electrons were energized back in the day when the plant absorbed that energy during photosynthesis and made those electron carriers and that got transferred to the glucose, and now they're being used right here to make ATP. By the way, again, this is the enzyme that cyanide blocks. This is the enzyme that stops the hydrogen ions from flowing out, and thus ATP is not produced, which is why you die, because you don't make any ATP when cyanide blocks those enzymes. All right. Here, we run into the opposite problem that photosynthesis had. Photosynthesis had the issue of having a source of electrons. We have the opposite problem. We need to get rid of the electrons. Enter oxygen. This is why oxygen is the most efficient way of producing ATP, because it, it has the highest affinity for electrons. It loves electrons more than any other molecule, which means that it can remove the electrons faster than any other molecule, hence the difference between aerobic and anaerobic respiration. So when oxygen comes into the uh, electron transport chain, 
it picks up the electrons, combines with some hydrogen ions, and lo and behold, turns back into water. Now as water builds up, it just leaks out through osmosis, and the oxygen leaks into the mitochondria through simple diffusion. So that's just how they get exchanged. That's why when we breathe, we pick up more oxygen, it goes to our cells, it gets picked up by the cells, it goes to the mitochondria, it gets turned into water, and so on and so forth. And as I mentioned, this one too right here, uh, you're not gonna have to memorize what goes in where, but it does, does illustrate that all organic molecules can be used in the glucose metabolism process. You've got fats, which when they're broken off, turn into acetyl groups, that enters right into the Krebs cycle. You've got glycerol, which can enter into the glycolysis cycle. You've got amino acids that can enter in at multiple stages of glucose metabolism, all in the end to, to produce ATP. So whether you're breaking down carbohydrates, fats, or proteins, in the end, they all turn into the same energy molecule. Doesn't matter. Now, fermentation is probably the most difficult part of this uh, lecture, uh, as far as the questions go and people understanding what's going on here. So just pay close attention. Some organisms have no mitochondria. So the only way in which they can produce energy is through glycolysis, because they don't have the preparatory reactions in the citric acid cycle and the electron transport chain. Without that organelle, you don't do those processes. You don't have the enzymes for it. So the only way in which they can produce ATP is through glycolysis. Okay, so there's a thing, there's something about glycolysis that you have to understand, is ATP is only produced after the NADH is produced or the electron carriers are produced. Let me go back to that uh, overall dynamic here. Here's glycolysis. And like I said, you're not gonna have to know the steps of glycolysis, but I wanna point something out. The first stage of what we call energy extraction of glycolysis, after you put some energy in, is first you have to get some electrons, you remove those electrons, and then the glycolysis process, the organic chemistry, can produce ATP. So this is what we would call the rate limiting step, meaning only as fast as you make these electron carriers can you make ATP. Well, normally, these electron carriers dump their electrons where? If you have mitochondria, where do they normally dump them? Where do they get rid of them in this step? Go to the electron transport chain. So normally, these go to the electron transport chain, dump their electrons, they come back, and they pick up some more. So as long as there's a constant recycling of these electron carriers, Glycolysis can just keep going over and over and over and over again. However, if there's no electron transport chain, what's the cell to do with these electron carriers? That's where fermentation comes into play. Fermentation is a electron carrier recycling process. It essentially recycles these electron carriers so that they can go back and pick up more electrons. So whereas the electron transport chain is normally the most efficient place to go for these electron carriers to dump their electrons, if there are no electron transport chains because there's no mitochondria, well, what are they to do? They essentially, instead of turning pyruvate into carbon dioxide um, through the preparatory reactions and through the Krebs cycle and then um, dumping the electrons in the electron transport chain, the electrons use that energy to split pyruvate into alcohol, ethanol, and carbon dioxide. And this is where we usually think of the fermentation process where bread is made, where alcohol is made, and the like. This isn't the only fermentation process though. For example, yogurt is made through fermentation. That's a completely different fermentation process, but it's still fermentation. So there's two main types of fermentation. There's the fermentation that produces alcohol, which occurs in yeast and some bacteria and the like. And then there's the fermentation that doesn't produce alcohol called lactic acid fermentation. That's the one that you and I do, as well as mother, other microbes, uh, for example, in cheese production and yogurt production and things like that. This process right here is irreversible. Why? Because when the pyruvate is split into ethanol and carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide just starts diffusing out. In fact, that's where the foam comes from. That's where the bubbles in the fermentation process come from. That's where the bread rises during the yeast fermentation process is the buildup of carbon dioxide in the dough. That's why you have to let it sit there and, and wait for a little bit as the bread rises because 
the carbon dioxide that's being produced during the fermentation process is, is puffing up the dough. Um, but the whole reason for fermentation is not for this. This is the only way that it can recycle these electron carriers. The whole reason is so that it can keep, uh, keep on um, making ATP through glycolysis. So let me be clear on this. Fermentation doesn't produce any ATP. It merely recycles the electron carriers. It's glycolysis that makes the ATP. So if an organism doesn't have any mitochondria, the only way they can make ATP is through glycolysis. Well, the only way that they can do glycolysis is to recycle these electron carriers. So that's one way that, that fermentation occurs. The other way is called lactic acid fermentation. Now this process is reversible. You and I undergo this process when we exercise and when we stress ourselves out. So why? Why would we ever do this if we have mitochondria? Because you're like, well, why don't the electron carriers get recycled at the electron transport chain where they should? Well, let me show you why. So, when we have mitochondria, this is the most efficient way of producing ATP. We get lots of ATP coming out of uh, mitochondria through this process, and the electron carriers essentially dump their electrons, and then they go back and they pick up some more, and so on and so forth. Well, let's say that you're stressing your muscles out by using lots and lots of ATP. There's a limit to how fast this can go. So let's just say for the sake of it that you're producing 40 ATP per second. It's more than that, but let's just say for the sake of it. 40 ATP per second. But let's say you're using 50 ATP per second. Well, this can't go any faster. So how else are you going to make energy? Well, remember, glycolysis is the process that pumps out ATP. In fact, two ATP for every glucose molecule. Well, if this is completely saturated, you're, you've got plenty of oxygen, you're making lots and lots of ATP, but you're pushing yourself faster than aerobic respiration alone can provide, then you have to do some glycolysis and fermentation on the side. Okay? So what ends up happening is you're recycling these electron carriers through lactic acid fermentation, and for every round of glycolysis, you make 2 ATP. So in fact, to make up that 10 ATP, how many rounds of glycolysis and fermentation do you need to do extra on top of this? Five, okay, to make that final ATP. So the long and the short of it is, the more you push yourself, the more you'll have to undergo glycolysis and fermentation in addition to aerobic respiration. Well, what's the byproduct of fermentation? Lactic acid, guess what? This prevents your muscles from contracting. It builds up in your muscles, you get cramps, and your liver will recycle this and turn it back into pyruvate. So it does leak into your blood. Your blood takes it to your liver. Your liver recycles it back into pyruvate, goes back into your cells, and can be turned into ATP. But that requires that you stop pushing yourself. <laughs> so anyway. That's why we undergo fermentation, and that's why lactic acid builds up, okay, is when we are exercising more and using more energy than aerobic respiration alone can provide, that's when fermentation kicks in. Now, there obviously is conditioning. You can condition your muscles so that they use less energy for the force of contraction. That's where conditioning comes into play, where you can push yourself faster and farther. There's a lot of physiological things that can change as you exercise so that you undergo less and less fermentation. But that's kind of the fundamentals behind it, is that if you're not producing as much ATP as you're using in your cells, then the only other way to make ATP is by doing glycolysis and fermentation in addition to aerobic respiration.